It's Thursday, August the 8th, 2024, and the time is 4.30 p.m. And this is the virtual town hall for electoral area C residents affected by the current evacuation alert in relation to the overland and debris flood risk at Pool Creek and Gates Lake. My name is Patricia Westerholm, and I'm the Director of Communications and Engagement at the SLRD. And during an Emergency Operations Center activation, my team and I take on the role of Public Information Officer. I'm joining you this afternoon virtually from the traditional unceded territory of the Lilwat Nation, and I'll be facilitating this meeting and coordinating the question and answer session following the presentations. The purpose of this virtual town hall is to hear from the technical experts on the assessment work done to date, and for the SLRD to provide an update on the Emergency Operations Center and our next steps. Before we get into the presentations, we will just go over a couple of quick housekeeping items. Uh, just a reminder that this town hall is being recorded. We ask that everyone keep their comments respectful and please consider your own privacy and the privacy of other residents when speaking. Can we go to the next slide, please, Michelle? And next slide again. Thanks. Um, so to turn on live captions, just click on the more button with the um, three dots there, and then the language and speech option and select turn on live captions. Um, if you are having audio issues, please check your settings on the more button as well to adjust the volume and ensure the correct speaker is selected. And you can also try leaving the meeting and rejoining. So before we move into the presentations, I will pass it over to Heather Paul, the SLRD's Chief Administrative Officer, for some opening remarks and introductions. Hi, everyone. Good to see you all here today. Um, glad we can all meet when people are at different places and times in their day that we can all meet here virtually and have a conversation about this. Uh, I want to thank everyone for coming tonight, including the staff. I'm sitting here on the shared unceded territory of the Squamish Ohomeo, known as Squamish Nation, and the Liwa'ul, known as Liwat Nation. And I'm grateful to be practicing on their land and living on their land and enjoying the beauty that has been cared for for since time immemorial. Um, I'm grateful to be here today with all of you, and I'm thankful for the work that the team has responded to so far. And hopefully we can answer some questions and clear up some uh, information about what the plan is moving forward and what happened. Uh, I want to take a moment to introduce everyone tonight. It is, uh, you'll have here, Electoral Area C Director, I feel like maybe I'm uh, announcing in the boxing ring, Russell Mack, which is on your top left-hand corner of your screen. Thank you, Russell, for being here. Mark Phillips, the SLRD Director of Protective Services. Mike Fusca, our, the SLRD Emergency Program Manager. Jay McEwen, the Chief Building Official at the SLRD, who, who also assisted in the initial assessment. Michelle LaRue, our Communications Coordinator, and Paul Case who is the IT support technician at the SLRD. Michelle and Paul are on the MST, MS team's technical lead, so they're going to ensure that everything's going to run smoothly, um, although it's technology, so you never know. And I really thank them for taking this on and making sure we won't even notice it'll be that smooth. Also on this call is Christian Fair, and I, I know he doesn't need an introduction. He's the fire chief with the Birkin Volunteer Fire Department, and he has assisted the SLRD tremendously, providing important situational awareness throughout the event and by maintaining communication with the community. And I really want to thank and acknowledge Christian for all his work. Everyone on this call probably knows how invaluable he is, and we really appreciate Christian's time and commitment to the community and everyone on this call. Joining us are also Stan Tech and Graham Vass and Graham Nibs. Yes, they're both Grams, spelled differently, but yes, you'll recognize you can tell the difference because they both have beards. You can't tell the difference, but thank you so much, Graham and Graham. Very much appreciate having you here and all of the geohazard risk assessments that and flood risk assessments that you have been doing up to date. And then joining probably on this call closer to five o'clock, 
will be Peter Cienciala from DFO, so from Fisheries and Oceans Canada. Hopefully, he's going to be able to make the call and answer a few questions. If he isn't, he said he'd try his best to be here by five. If he isn't, then we'll collect the questions, answer what we can. However, D depart like fisheries and oceans are the lead when it comes to the fish habitat and the salmon habitat, and we will collect those questions and get back to you and share them when uh, Peter can answer them. So thank you very much. Great to see everyone here, and I'm just going to pass it over to Director Mac if you'd like to say a few words. Uh, thank you, Heather. Hi, everyone. Uh, most of you probably already know me, but I'm Russell Mac, the uh, Electoral Area C Director. Um, Really happy to be here tonight and to receive an update from the SLRD. I'm looking forward to it, and I'm sure you are too. So uh, before we move on, I'd really like to thank everybody for the response to this emergency and also the community for your cooperation and patience as we work through this. As you all know, bureaucracy is a wonderful thing to deal with, so we're having fun, I'm sure. But um, I have to really thank our, our group of people, Mark and all his team, and as uh, Heather said, a special shout out goes to uh, Chief Christian Fair, who's done, you know, an amazing job. He's on the ground. He's there to answer questions. And uh, please feel free to use them. Um, and at that, I will pass it back to uh, Patricia. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Heather and Director Mack. We will move into the presentation, starting with Graham Voss and Graham Nibs from Stantec, and then followed by Mike Fusca from the SLRD. Once we've completed the presentations, we will move into the question and answer portion, at which time we'll share the instructions on how to participate in that. So without further ado, please let me introduce Graham Voss and Graham Nibs from Stantec, who will provide an update on the assessment and the work that has been done to date. Hello, everyone. Let me just share my screen. It looks like sharing has not been activated. Is there any way the organizers can provide access for sharing? I'm looking into it. Great. Uh, but we can start with introductions while uh, this is getting set up. My name is Graham Vass. I'm a senior hydrotechnical engineer with Stantec. Uh, I live in Squamish and I go to Anderson Lake most weekends. So. I know the Gates Lake area quite well. Um, I have been providing support with the flood hazard and debris flood hazard assessments. My colleague, Graham Nibs, spelled the incorrect way, uh, can give a, an introduction for himself. Yeah, that's right. I'm Graham with the dark blue shirt on today. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm Graham Nibs. Uh, I'm sitting here in Ladysmith, BC, just across the pond on the island. Um, I specialize in geomorphology and geohazards, uh, particular interest in debris flows. Um, I was on site on August 2nd to do a, a flyby on uh, and do a geohazard assessment there to look in for any residual hazards to public safety. Um, so we'll, we'll get into that in a bit once we get our presentation going here. Um, but yeah, that's it for now. Hey, so without further ado, um, yeah, the intent of this presentation is to provide an update on the activities that Stantec and the SRD have taken following the July 21st um, debris flood event. So let's jump in. So I'd like to first give a little background on the event itself. Um, let's just start with an overview. I'm, I'm sure everyone knows the area well, but this is Gates Lake down here. This is Place Glacier located here. Um, the original alignment of Place Creek, well, the pre-flood event alignment of Place Creek came down this steep canyonized area and follow this blue dashed line along here to intercept with Pool Creek down at this location. The important thing to note is that there is the divide between the watersheds at this location right here, known as Pemberton Pass. On the right side here, this is the Lillooet River and Birkenhead River watershed. On the left side here, this is the Fraser River watershed. So before this event, the um, uh, Place Creek flew in, or flowed into the Birkenhead and Lillooet River um watersheds so on july 21st there was a lake located up here in the glacier that graham will touch on in the next slide um, it had a sudden outburst event so a full draining of the lake that water came down the mountainside here and initiated a debris flood event 
So a debris flood event is when flood waters pick up or entrain sediments and woody debris along the banks and channel, um, further increasing the associated flow of that flood and exacerbating erosion and scour and flooding uh, downstream. So the debris flood event came down the mountain here and at some point here where it flattens out a bit started settling. Um, but in this area here, what happened was as the debris was coming down, it either overtopped the banks due to the flood flow or a combination of both flood flow and the debris settling in the channel and caused, caused an avulsion or a rapid change of the channel alignment. Uh, so at this point here, the channel changed its direction and is now flowing through the forested area here, transitioning to the flatter area here along the BC Hydro right -aways, and flowing through the properties here and into the lake. So <clears throat> immediately following the event, um, there was a large pulse of water, but after the initial pulse uh, receded, you still had overland flooding impacting these properties down here and properties at the other side of Gates Lake adjacent to Gates River. Um, associated with the overland flooding that was impacting properties through here, you had a sudden increase in the Gates Lake water level. Um, this had the impact of going above the natural boundary or this, the existing sort of top of bank of the shoreline and flooding the foreshore areas and potentially going to the crawl spaces of certain structures. Um, next slide, Graham Nibs will give a little more detail on the actual outburst event. Yeah, so what we'll look at here is uh, you can see the, the satellite imagery that's available kind of surrounding the or bracketing the, the event days, which was on July 21st. Um, you'll see in the top image, you can see the upper lake. Just, just for reference, we don't have a north arrow on here, but top of the image is north. So we're kind of looking down towards uh, Place Creek and, and down into the valley that way. So kind of on the south end or the upper elevations of the glacial cirque, you can see this perched lake that's circled in red here. Um, that's visible here on July 17th in the imagery. And then if we look again on the bottom image here, July 23rd, so kind of bracketing again the days of that event, you can see that that lake is evacuated or, or completely drained out. Now, Graham, if you just want to hit the next slide there. Yeah, perfect. This is a, an image taken during our, our helicopter flight here on August 2nd. Um, you can see this, this essentially is that upper lake that drained out here. You can see there's some ice blocks sitting on top of the, the, the ice surface there. That's actually, if you flip back, actually, Graham, we can see those ice blocks floating in, in the image itself there on the top. That's right. So you kind of get an indication of what that lake level was. Um, and so what we were hypothesizing is that there was perhaps maybe a, a glacial dam or, or some kind of ice dam kind of along the, the basal surface of this glacier. Uh, it wasn't really clear how this lake drained, but we were presuming that it, it drained subglacially along here. Um, during during our flight back, we didn't see this lake filling back up. Um, there is a potential. It's uncertain at this point whether or not this lake is going to fill back up in the future. Uh, but for sure, it, it is a potential. Um, so following that, the lake evacuated. It caused an outburst uh, flood event in the upper lake. We'll show some pictures of that later on here. Uh, that broke the weir that was at the mouth of the, the lower lake, and that obviously caused the debris flood to, to rush down the mountain. Perfect, thanks. So that dovetails nicely into the yeah. discussion on the observed overland flooding. So there was the debris flood that came down and came along the new channel alignment here. Um, there wasn't a, to our understanding, an existing channel located within this area. There were two drainage um, ditches that ran along the property here and here. We'll show those further in the next couple slides. But um, as the flood flow came through here and transitioned to this flatter portion, it spread out over a large area. Um, when that occurred, it had two different flood paths. One of them went into this drainage ditch here that followed along the ditch and now led into Gates Lake. The other one spread out over a large area and impacted properties along the shoreline of Gates Lake here. On the other end of the lake, so over here, um, following the rapid increase of Gates Lake water levels, this resulted in increased flow going through Gates River. Um, it subsequently went over its banks and flooded the overland areas here. This is 9234 Pemberton Portage Road, and we can see that it's flooded out the fields in this location here. So following the 
uh, well, Stantec was on the ground on July 23rd, and we provided some immediate um, works to mitigate the flood potential to the properties here and here. Um, this involved removing some culverts and removing some debris that was plugged within the channels. This, at that time, it helped alleviate the overland flooding through this ditch and into these areas. Um, but on July 29th, there was a rainfall event that occurred, a relatively minor rainfall event. Um, when we were on the ground on July 30th, it was shown that overland flooding pattern had actually changed some to some degree. And this is to be expected with these braided, meandering, um, poorly defined channels here. They have a tendency to, they call it meandering or lateral migration, moving back and forth throughout the deposited debris flood material or sediments. Um, so what was happening was that the pattern was changing and more flow was being conveyed through this ditch which was not sized to handle Place Creek flow. Um, and therefore we were getting an increased amount of overland flooding, which was impacting both this property and uh, I believe that's the end's property over here and potentially going over further to Ahmed's property. Um, what we, what Stantec SLRD did in response to this was to implement some emergency works. These emergency works are in definition emergency. They're, they're uh, they're required to provide protection for immediate um, flood concerns. So what that approach did was incorporate additional drainage ditches and bulk bags into this design. So just give a little background here. This line is that first drainage ditch, or we're calling it the existing unnamed channel. And then this was the other existing ditch that came along these two properties and that led into Gates Lake. What we implemented was a channel along this red alignment that would collect the overland flow um, and project it down to the green line here that would then outlet into the Gates Lake. We then created a additional barrier. You can see here these bulk bags placed offset from the channel and placed along the alignment all the way up to somewhere around here. Um, once that was in place, we then plugged the ditch to prevent further overland flooding within this area. Um, we completed the majority of this work by Sunday, which was good timing because on August 4th and 5th, there was a substantially larger rainfall event. Um, the, the, the system functioned well, which was good to see, um, but Gates Lake level seemed to fluctuate following that level or following that rainfall event. Um, it had increased to levels that were seen around July 23rd, basically. And from our understanding, that increase in lake level also resulted in further flooding of crawl spaces and erosion of the foreshore or shoreline. So, Sandec has been conducting this qualitative assessment of debris flood and debris flood hazards, and there are a number of ongoing flood and debris flood hazards that are of importance. First one is the glacier lake is now empty. In the immediate future, prior to the winter, we don't anticipate another outburst event. Um, another impact is for flooding potential. In the summer, we're gonna have increased solar radiation or hot temperature days, uh, which are going to increase glacial runoff and melt, and that's gonna be conveyed through here. So in response to that, you're gonna see increased uh, flow through the uh, diverted ditch system and potential fluctuations in the lake level. Additionally, <clears throat> in response to rainfall events, you're going to see increased flow within this channel and uh, increased fluctuations in Lake Gates Lake level as it responds and recedes to the uh, increased flow. Um, continued debris flood hazard is going to be something to watch for as well. The creek itself has somewhat channelized through its new alignment. However, there's quite a lot of low-lying banks um, adjacent to that channel. So if you get a sudden increase in flow associated with rainfall or glacier melt, it has the potential to overtop those banks and create additional avulsions um, along the forested area. This would promote further entrainment of sediments in large wood debris that could be shifted down the channel and increase the potential for flooding and uh, increase in lake levels. Um, the other 
points to be made are geohazards, and my colleague Graham Nibbs will touch on those now. So I'll pass it on to Graham. Yeah, thanks. Um, so as Graham Bass was mentioning, you know, the primary hazard here is is debris floods and clear water flooding, right? Um, that's 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 the hazard that was experienced during the following the outburst event. Um, my job was to kind of come in and look for other residual hazards that might occur, right? And so that that's more so related to landslide events, rockfall events, um, further out further outbursts, uh, and as well as avulsion hazards as well. To avulsion again being that that stream channel jumping, right? So again, my my flight took place on August second. I had the pleasure of uh, sitting in the helicopter with with Mike Fusca that's on the call here today, and then uh, members of Lil Watt and uh, uh, Nakak. Uh, sorry, I'm gonna I can't pronounce that last name, but um, Nakakwa. Yeah, thanks, Graham. Appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, so we had both nations in the helicopter with us. Uh, we flew the upper elevations and then we also flew the affected areas just kind of looking for these residual hazards. And you can see here in this photo on the right, um, we're just looking right at kind of the mouth of, of uh, Place Creek, right where the glacier outlets there. And you can see some of the debris that would have came down and carved out. Now, if you actually flick onto Google Earth or any of the satellite imagery, you'll see that this debris field below the glacier actually, it, it appears that there's been events that have happened in the past, but uh, you can see the contemporary event here has carved out some some nick points along the the channel side banks, et cetera, that we'll that we'll get into here. So, thanks, bud. Sorry, my kids just leaving for camp right now. <laughs> if you want to just flick to the next one, thanks, Graham. So here, if we look, we're looking at the uh, oh, go back one, please. Yeah, we're just looking at the lower glacial lake here. So. If I had my mouse to point uh, in the back upper elevations of the cirque, that's where the glacial, the upper glacial lake would have evacuated out, uh, causing the run up through this lower lake. Um, you can see in the bottom of the image, we have that broken weir. So there was a weir structure there that that's now uh, broken and, and flow is uh, flowing unobstructed through there. So kind of to Graham's point before, we're not anticipating an outburst. And, and that's largely because that upper lake has lost that potential energy, right? It's gone now. That, that potential energy is gone. Now we have uncontrolled flows happening through the lake. So while the flows may be more sustained and, and larger than typical because of that weir being gone, um, we don't anticipate, you know, kind of those dynamic or acute uh, outburst response again. Uh, but we do anticipate increased flows during uh, rain on snow events or, you know, sustained uh, melt events too. Uh, if we just look on to the next one now, Graham. Yeah, perfect. So. This is just an image of the channel uh, further down from the mouth of the lake there. And you can see that stream flow is undercutting these unconsolidated banks. So these are really deep deposits that have formed over, you know, thousands of years since since that glacier has been there. Right. Um, and as these flows come down, they're undercutting that stream bank. And what we observe from the helicopter is that there's a lot of raveling occurring along those banks. Uh, there is a uh, potential for small volume landslides to occur and bulk that channel. And that's likely to result in sediment laden flows and, and turbid flows. Um, likely that that turbid flow is going to be pretty consistent. However, we might get pulses of more sediment laden flow or or turbid flows again, too. And, and again, those will be exacerbated during um, high rainfall events or sustained melt events. Right. And if we just flip one more gram, please. Yeah. Um, I was just going to talk about the avulsion hazard here too. Unfortunately, this picture doesn't quite show it, but along the apex of the fan, so the fan being the depositional area where we're transitioning from the steep uh, mountainous terrain kind of into the depositional area of the creek, um, there is a potential that we identified and Graham identified this on the ground as well too, um, for the uh, stream to migrate again back into its original uh, channel in Pool Creek, or it might just stay in there and just become more entrenched in its its current form already too. So. That is a potential that we identified through this hazard assessment as well too um yeah and when we talked about landslides hazards before too here this this is a great kind of figure to show that what what was experienced after the outburst uh event was a flood event it wasn't a landslide uh it may have translated from a landslide from the steeper terrain into a flood however if there are landslides in the future from the steep terrain or some of that unconsolidated sediment that's raveling off the sides uh, it's anticipated to deposit upslope of the uh, BC Hydro right away here or shortly there on. You can see it in the photo here where, where most of the flood deposit occurred on the BC Hydro right away. So an immediate landslide threat at this point, you know, is, is relatively low um, and it's it's not a major concern to public safety at this time. Great, thanks Graham. <clears throat> so next steps, Stantec is presently completing the 
qualitative assessment to identify geohazard, flood, and debris flood hazards that pose an immediate risk to the public. And from that, we're going to be recommending next steps. Um, SLRD further retains Stantec to complete a more fulsome or quantitative assessment. Uh, the purpose of this is to assess what geohazard floods and debris flood hazards exist as a result of the increased Gates Lake level and the realignment of Place Creek and to Gates Lake and what impact that may have on adjacent properties following certain return period flow events. Um, understanding on this as well that time is of the essence and that um, recommendations need to be in place prior to the increased rainfall events in the fall. What's happening as well is that SLRD and Stantec are consulting with DFO, Walrus, and uh, EMBC um, to determine whether immediate realignment of Place Creek into its previous alignment flowing into Pool Creek is required to mitigate hazards posed to the salmon within the Birkenhead River. Um, we're also working with Lillowatt, um to, to uh, work that one through all the regulatory bodies. And again, on that one, time is of the essence. So that is ongoing in the background as well. Um, yeah, so thank you for your time and I'll pass it back over to SLRD. Great, I think we're moving into Mike's presentation here, yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks, Patricia. Uh, good, evening, good evening, everyone. My name is Mike Fusca, and I'm the Emergency Program Manager for the Squamish Hill Regional District. Uh, I was the Emergency Operations Center Director for the first couple weeks of this flood and debris flood event. I'm joining you today from the traditional and unceded territory of the Squamish Nation. We first became aware of flooding in the Gates Lake and Pool Creek areas on the morning of Monday, July 22nd. Emergency flood protection work was undertaken in the following days, and then in the following week, we continued to assess the drainage and water levels in and around Gates Lake. By Sunday, July 28th, it was becoming apparent the water levels were not receding as fast as we had hoped, and noting the rain forecast for the following days, we issued an evacuation alert for eight properties on Gates Lake out of an abundance of caution. We undertook more emergency flood protection work last week, and the current evacuation alert will remain in place until we observe and confirm the effectiveness of that work over time. Along the way, we declared a state of local emergency on August 1st in order to undertake emergency work on the private property uh, that was described in uh, Stantex update. This state of local emergency was not related to any specific change in hazard risk, but rather it was an administrative measure uh, for that flood protection work uh, in accordance with provincial emergency response legislation. The SLD's current priority is addressing any outstanding uh, public safety issues, especially uh, prior to the fall atmospheric river uh, rainy season. Uh, next slide, please. Our next step is to work with the Ministry of Emergency Management and Climate Readiness to fund a quantitative flood and geohazard risk assessment, which will be conducted by Stantec. Uh, this will also discuss the potential for rechanneling the flow back into Pool Creek, uh, which would require a funding request to the province as an emergency public safety measure. Community members who are experiencing non-public safety related impacts from this flooding on their properties are encouraged to connect with their insurance providers as soon as possible and the SLRD will be able to provide uh, more information about long-term resolutions once that Stantec flood and geohazard risk assessment is completed. The SLRD is working through EMCR to ensure that uh, relevant provincial and federal departments uh, to lead work uh, to protect salmon habitat. Uh, we continue to work with the Liliwat Nation, the Nkwakwa First Nation, uh, the Ministry of Waters, Waters, Lands and Resource Stewardship, and the Department of Fisheries and Oceans in areas where we can help to resolve this issue. Uh, and with that, I'll hand it back to Patricia for our Q&A period. Thank you. Okay, um, thanks Mike, Graham and Graham for your very informative presentations. Um, we will get to the question and answer period shortly. Um, just a few more uh, minor housekeeping items to go over before we, we get there. Um, if you're joining from the Teams app or a web browser, you will see this banner. Um, yours may not have all of these features visible, but we do ask that to ask a question, please use the raise hand function to join the queue and we will take the questions in the order that hands are raised. Um, your microphone will be enabled so that you can ask your question, but you'll also need to turn on your microphone at your end as well. To turn on your camera and microphone, use the camera and mic buttons. 
Um, this slide shows how to use Teams on your mobile phone. Raise and lower your hand by pressing the hand button. To access more features, swipe up from the bottom. And from here, you can turn on and off your camera and microphone, turn on captions, and change your audio settings. Uh, if you're dialing into this meeting, um, raise your hand by pressing star five and you will be entered into the queue. You can unmute yourself by pressing star six and this function will be verbally indicated once the SLRD team has enabled your microphone. And so with all of that, I think we're ready to move into the question and answer period. So please raise your hand if you have a question and we will direct those to the appropriate people. I think we've got a question from Rick and Nancy King, it looks like. Can you unmute them, Sean? I've done that, uh, Patricia. Thanks, Paul. I think on your end, you need to unmute your mic. Oh, there you go. Oh, I saw it. <laughs> Can you unmute the microphone on your end? Paul, is it on their end that they need to unmute yep. themselves? Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've allowed it at our end, and uh, so they need to uh, enable the mic at their end. Patricia, perhaps you could go back to the yeah. screenshot with the image. Uh, Michelle, can you do that, please? We could also go to the next question, maybe while we're waiting. And it looks to me from the quality of the great image that I see of Rick and Nancy that they are on a computer. So this is the screen. Yeah. If so, Rick or Nancy, if you want to nod, if you see if someone could circle the, the microphone image for them. If you can nod to tell me if you see that it's unmuted. So it says it's unmuted on their part. Maybe we can go to the next caller and Paul could look at it. Caller. Sure. Question. Yeah, okay. Susie, Susie is the next and her mic is also uh, enabled at our end. There you go. Oh, there she goes. So, well, first, I just want to thank uh, everybody for the update today. I found it extremely useful. Um, I noted that um, you guys showed a picture of water in our field. Uh, I think that was at the beginning of the flood. It uh, it has spread uh, quite quite a lot since that picture was taken. And um, we, my nephew, was brave enough to walk out into that field, and and we we have cattle, and we use that field for grazing. And it's about three feet underwater at the moment. Um, it doesn't quite look like that in the picture, but it, it's it's pretty deep there. Um, and of course, that water comes around into our orchard and then back into uh, Gates Creek, which is, is pretty much at the top of its bank and is behaving more like a river. It's flowing really fast than the nice little creek we used to have that sort of meandered through the farm. So I'm pleased to hear that there's some effort to look at the potential of rerouting it back into the original channel. Um, that will certainly make us uh, feel a little bit better um, and a little bit uh, more confident that we're not gonna get wiped out as we've noted that uh, the creek uh, at the beginning just sort of spread over to the orchard side of the creek, but it, it has moved onto the house side as well. Um, so that that is, I guess our biggest concern. And there's one corner that if it was to breach, it would go right into the barn and and uh, it has the potential of wiping out the barn and all of the hay that's in it. So um, we're um, pleased that you guys are aware that there's flooding on this lake, um, but there's still some, some concerns that we have with regard to, um, you know, what's next. And uh, I know there's a lot that needs to be done in order to, sort of mitigate the impacts of, of um, you know, the flooding. Um, but um, I'm, I'm glad to hear that there's there's efforts um, to address to address it. So uh, thank you. 
Sí. Thanks, Susie. Um, Rick and Nancy, are you able to unmute your mic on your computer? There is the uh, chat box option too, Patricia, if they want to maybe try that. And maybe uh, while this can sort out, uh, Susie, thank you very much for that question. I will uh, yeah, note your concerns, and I know Graham uh, and the team have been on the ground and are uh, very aware. Uh, yeah, we are very lucky to we're lucky to have uh, Stantec uh, with us on this to help uh, to help us uh, find a uh, resolution in terms of public safety. And I know that we we are uh, and Stantec are expediting that as soon as we have that qualitative uh, understanding uh, of potential solutions to this and recommendations, we will be moving on it uh, uh, as soon as possible. Thanks, Mark. Um, looks like we have a few more questions. Uh, just trying to get them in order here. Yeah, um, Rick. Sorry, Patricia. Oh, Rick oh. and Nancy were next, um, but um, uh, they need to enable the mic at their end. And in the meantime, um, I have enabled the mic for Mike Rogers. Okay. Mike, did you want to go ahead with your question, please? Same issue, Mike. You need to enable the mic at your end. I think it'd be good. I, I feel bad. I think maybe Mike is speaking and we can't hear you, Mike. I'm very sorry. Let's go to the number four um, caller. I can't see the name on my screen. So, Paul, are you able to do that? The next one is Karen and Jeff. Hi there. Um, I have a question. I have two questions, actually. Uh, the first one is uh, you mentioned that, or uh, the SLRD Emergency Operations Center mentioned um, that if we're experiencing non-public safety related impacts from flooding, I'm just wondering what the parameters are for when it is considered an impact that needs to be reported. Um, we, you know, it uh, the 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 creek will flood by our place, but it won't impact our house. But what environmental damage constitutes an impact enough to alert somebody? Yeah, so Karen, it's um, it's about the evacuation of uh, the uh, activation of uh, emergency support services. So if your house is uninhabitable and uh, I need to tap into government funds to put you up in a hotel, provide food vouchers, um, clothing and things like that, like if you need to be evacuated from your home, uh, then uh, uh, or if there's a risk that uh, that kind of thing would happen, um, that's the kind of public safety risk where it makes it a lot easier for us to to access provincial money to to mitigate it from a public safety perspective as opposed to uh, uh, non uh, non life safety um, insurable property damage. OK, and so it's all about the property and if there's like debris buildup or something like that, we we can trust that you are on it, that somebody's on that already. Uh, I guess. You could still flag it to us. Uh, absolutely. If you're concerned about a specific spot, uh, we've done this a number of times is, uh, you know, you could send me an email um, and we'll ask uh, uh, Graham or someone from Stantec to go out there and, and take a look and, and just be sure. Okay. Um, and then my second, thank you. Uh, my second question is just um, considering what we're learning from this kind of situation. Are there other points um, of interest in the same um area that you have your eye on that we should know about as potential hazards if um you know the same thing happens somewhere else like other steep creeks yeah so i'm sure you know the area uh, there's a number of steep steep creeks you know neff creek for example everyone knows went in 2015 and we put properties uh, near there on um, evacuation alert and order in the 2021 atmospheric river um mm -hmm. There's, uh, I don't think, 
any of those steep creeks are posing a particular concern at this time, but uh, but the area is, is I mean, it's, it's steep terrain. Um, it's, uh, I mean, there are no known, known geohazards uh, throughout the area. Okay, thank you. And Kieran, maybe I can add is that uh, as part of our follow up as well, we can definitely uh, uh, provide a link to the uh, web page that houses all of the uh, kind of the hazard reports uh, that have been undertaken across the SLRD. Are they forecasts as well? No, there's no. Uh, uh, in some cases, uh, return periods are identified. I don't think a return period has been identified for um, for this one or for or for Neff Creek. Um, that usually requires typically a, a months long uh, geohazard study. Um, yeah. Okay. Thanks very much for your hard work, everybody. Thank you. Um, Paul, can you see who the next uh, question is with? But we're still waiting for Rick and uh, Nancy, and we're also waiting for Mike Roger to enable their mic at their end. And um, while we're waiting for them, so next one is Jens. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess my question is a follow up to what Susie mentioned about uh, uh, the water levels. Uh, uh, Susie's downstream from the lake. Uh, we're upstream. Uh, we are on the inflow side uh, along the drainage ditch. Uh, and I guess my question is specifically around uh, tracking water levels. Uh, we've seen a lot of dynamic changes. Uh, particularly with the rain uh, event that we had on Monday, but uh, even day to day uh, and throughout the day, there are changes. Uh, I'm just wondering if that is being monitored and if that is being considered in your analysis. Yes, hi, Jens. Um, definitely the fluctuations from even over the course of a day, it's uh, they call it diurnal. Um, fluctuations. It's it's due to as the day progresses and it gets hotter and hotter, you get more glacier melt coming down, which increases the flow, which causes the water level to to come up slightly. And then overnight, when it's colder, you get less flow coming down. And so that's why you're saying over the course of a day, fluctuations in the lake levels. Um, what what I did on July 23rd was put in a monitoring stake at the the water's edge at that point. So every time that myself or my colleagues are going to site, we're taking a look at that stake over the course of the day to, to just track how much that is changing. And uh, yeah, like I, it's, what you're seeing is what we're seeing as well. In response to those rainfall events, you're getting an increase in, in water level. I, I think um, the latest one after the fourth and the fifth was about five centimeters or so. So it's it's being tracked by us and it's, it's informing our, uh, our assessment. And uh, sorry, if I could just ask a quick, quick follow-up question. Uh, I, I assume your modeling uh, includes the uh, estimated uh, seasonal rainfalls uh, in, in the fall uh, as, as part of your risk assessment? Yeah, so the, the, the quantitative is the $10 word for it, uh, assessment where it's going to include hydrologic modeling and hydraulic modeling. So the hydrologic one is basically saying, what are the rainfall flows coming in from Place Creek and also the adjacent tributaries to Gates Lake, um, determining what is a, you know, one in two year return period flow, what's a one in 10, one in 200, um, and then running it through a hydraulic model of the new Place Creek alignments, Gates Lake, and then extending a distance downstream on Gates River. So then you put the rainfall, the estimated rainfall intensity through the model. It then will output what are associated water levels and velocities and other hydraulics that uh, would inform the assessment. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. Are we able to go to the next question? Iran is next. Hey, it's uh, Taryn here. Uh, I'm I'm representing my wife and I, who own 9102 Pemberton Portage Road, and we've sort of been. Um, <laughs> We've been at the nexus and it's sort of ground zero for lack of a better term of the of the water flow. And I want to just start by also reemphasizing the gratitude we have to everyone, Kevin, from from um, I believe he's a volunteer with Dykes and Waterways to both the Grams and Duncan 
uh, from Zantech, the SLRD. Um, every every department we've talked to has just been so responsive, and and we've seen the hard work um, from what started as sort of a very sc scary situation and is now just a stressful one. <laughs> um, but we are so so grateful to the hard work of, of everyone. I have I have two and a half uh, three questions that are that are um, hopefully uh, quick to quick to answer. One, I just would love if we could talk about the time frame, not about an actual switch, not about the work being done, but just understanding the time frame of this um, substantial assessment or uh, of, of the next steps, just understanding how much time that will take, um, hopefully leading up to, to a, a firm decision from the province and from DFO and, and Walrus and all the fun acronyms. Um, and, I guess I guess those are kind of the, the, like the time frame and 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 uh, how long this assessment would take. The other question is, um, what for what reason would we uh, keep the flow as it currently stands? Because I just I also want to go on record for my wife and I. We are very excited to switch it back <laughs> to get it back towards Pool Creek. Um, we are on the record saying that that we'd love to get the water flowing the other way. Um, not that we're not very proud owners of a brand new river down the middle of our land, but um, just for for safety and for for the community as it is, uh, just our understanding is there's there's only good reasons to get it back towards pool, and we don't know why it would ever stay feeding into gates the way it is. Uh, Taran, I can I can start. Uh, so in terms of timeline. Um, as always, I'm the kind of guy who likes to under promise and over deliver, but I will say that we see it as very, very important from a public safety perspective to have whatever work that needs to get done, get done before the fall atmospheric river or rainy season. And we expect that to start at the end of September. So I would say that the time I can't, I can't provide an, uh, an accurate, you know, start date or end date, but I, I think it's measured in weeks, not months. Um, there's a separate issue related to salmon habitat that's being led by, uh, you know, other branches of provincial and federal government. Um, I think everyone understands that that's on a short timeline as well. Um, and that uh, public safety measures that we undertake could also be very beneficial to salmon. Um, so that's another reason to keep things moving. But, uh, you know, I could say that as late as, as four o'clock this afternoon, we were meeting on this, uh, you know, getting the momentum going. Um, but uh, no schedule beyond that has been provided yet. Thank you, Mike. And then, and then, just just what is the scenario? Like, why would it ever? Who? Why would it? Why would the decision, or could there even be the decision to keep it as is? And and why would that be? I mean, I think that's hard for. That's definitely hard for me to say. Not being a, a technical expert. Um, yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. Uh... Yeah. Maybe Graham or Graham. Yeah, I don't know. Graham, do you want to take a crack at that one or? Yeah, for sure. It's it's a holistic approach to these sort of items. Um, the big is the most important thing is the hazard assessment. The hazard assessment what is informs the recommendations and mitigative actions that would be required there. So the only really way that nothing would be done is if a hazard assessment indicated that there was no hazard. I mean, based on what I'm seeing and hearing from people, it sounds like this is impacting their their homes, their livelihoods, and their appreciation and enjoyment of their properties. So, you know, the, the hazard assessment will lead to the recommended course of action there. So I'm, I'm not trying to say anything before I finish the hazard assessment, but it's quite clear that your lives, your properties are being impacted right now. So all these things will go in and inform our hazard assessment. The other impact is um habitat environment those things so we need to work hand in hand with dfo walrus and other and first nations communities to ensure that any recommendations that come out of the um the hazard assessment are complementary to environmental considerations so that's kind of a roundabout way of saying that the the, the hazard assessment is really the critical item to inform it and uh, it is of the highest priority to me to complete this as quickly as possible. Um, and yeah, that's uh, that's kind of the best answer I can provide. Yeah, if I can 
Yeah, I think that was really good, Graham. If I could just add a bit of a, a geomorphology twist on this too. I mean, when we look at these fan area or fan deposits, I don't, I don't, unfortunately don't have a good slide for it, but you can see these large wedge shapes kind of coming out as they as they get onto the flat valley bo valley bottom, right? It's it's a natural process for these streams to to meander and and to move across that fan, and that that's how that fan was built over thousands of years, right? So this is a natural process that that has occurred. Um, however, we are seeing you know these these glacial hazards and the frequency of of these outburst type of events affecting communities increasing across the province, uh, and that's largely a, a climate hazard that's being addressed. So. I just wanted to, to make that known as well, too. Thank you all so much. Thank you again for your hard work. Thanks, Paul. Is there another um, question that we can get to? Yeah, I'm going to go back to um, Rick and Nancy for a second. Um, on my screen, uh, Rick and Nancy, the uh, mic button is top right hand side of the screen. And it's the from going from the right to the left, it's like the third button with the mic on it. So if you guys want to uh, click on that, then uh, hopefully uh, that will um, enable you to ask your question. Let me select users, can I mute? Okay, if not, then uh, we're going to go to uh, Susan. Susan and Hamed. If you are speaking, we can't hear you. Your mic is disabled. Okay, so I guess we're going to go to the next person, uh, Ian Collins. Paul, do you do you want? Can I just can I just recognize something? Uh, quite a few people are writing something down. They're all saying that only select users can unmute. I want to recognize that's a technical problem on our side that has nothing to do with the users that are in the room asking questions. And I really want to say I'm sorry about that. We um, had seen this in another meeting and leaving and coming back seemed to solve the problem or at least allow, allow us to enable your mic again. So it not that I want you to leave, I promise. It might work if you come back. And I would like to recognize again this is a problem on our side, not their side. Twice they've put up the note saying that only select users can unmute. So we're going to fix that for you. Okay. Um, well, well, so give them a moment to come back and maybe we can go to a different question. I, I think it might also be true, Heather, that um, remember with all the questions, I'm enabling the mic at our end also. So not, not everybody mm -hmm. on the call can enable their mic unless I enable it at our end first. So it might be a uh, uh, a combination of things, them thinking that they can enable the mic while well, I haven't done it on our end. Thanks, Paul. All right. Uh, Thanks, Paul. Uh, We're, let's go back uh, to the meeting. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I think so, we have a couple um, of people. Yeah, give me a second here. We have uh, Maggie. Go ahead, Maggie. No. Okay. So let's go to Jens. Sorry, I actually just want to say that Hamidou Medali is trying to ask a question, um, and he's not able to to un, um, he's not able to uh, raise his hand. So if you could unmute him, that would be great. Thanks. Sorry, who is that? Hamidou Medali. Hamid. I am not seeing him on. Uh, let me see here. Um, I'm not was, see. Yeah, Paul, he was there. He may have uh, gone off and is coming back on. 
Okay. Can't, okay. Yeah, Sorry. Okay. Okay. Um, give me a second here. Sorry, just bear with me for a second. Um, Karen and Jeff, you guys can go. Hi, it's Kieran again. I just wanted to confirm that yes, Heather, it is um, that you have to you have to actually approve that your mic is used before you log in. So um, if they haven't done that, uh, they have to leave and then come back. And then the second thing is um, you don't have the chat turned on, so people can't use that to tell people that they're having troubles. So maybe if you turn that on, they could they could say. Oh, and the third thing was it was Susan and Hamid. I think was the the person who was trying to get in, in contact. Anyway, just notes. Yeah. OK, thanks. Thank you so much. <laughs> no problem. Ken, you can go ahead. Yes, hello, Ian Collins. Um, I'm uh, um, on the uh, Pool Creek side of uh, um, this incident. Uh, on lot 1547 and uh we've i've observed uh, pool, uh place creek um for those of you with um dealing with the flooding i can tell you that it varies much more uh widely with temperature than it does with rainfall so um if they for some reason decide not to uh, place it back in the bank that it's or the direction that it's occupied for the last hundred years. Um, hopefully there'll be some relief. Um, I'm hoping that uh, you'll involve BC Hydro uh, because the slashing, you know, that where that debris fan is and and that area, um, uh, the um, there's excess erosion under there after they built the 500 line and now with the uh, the slashing activity that happens there. Uh, the beavers have established themselves up there and they use the slash and the undergrowth that happens there. And they will, they, they've been damming fairly regularly. And the evolution, ev, uh, ev, elevation change from um, needed to uh, make that uh, Place Creek uh, flow into the gates drainage versus the pool creek drainage is pretty subtle uh and in fact uh you know when i was a kid the uh um the there was a an irrigation canal very small like uh you know like six inches square that diverted water uh from place creek and it flowed out through into gates creek even while the bulk of that uh water um, flowed uh, um, and joined uh, Pool Creek on our property. So, you know, like there's even even in when you reestablish it to its uh, um, recent historic path, it's quite capable of migrating uh, back and forth, even without uh, a large uh, debris flow down from the place glacier. And I think you need BC Hydro's involvement there. They've already, um, you know, created some issues on the Pool Creek side where in 1970, the dump slash in the, in the river and it blocked up behind the railroad. And, uh, you know, when it finally let go, it tore the bottom out of Pool Creek and now Pool Creek um, on the upper section above the Place Creek Junction, um, where it, ju it can flow underground for part of the year, and you know salmon that used to come as far as there, of course, can't anymore. And uh, you know, so they need to be also part of the uh, uh, ongoing solution, and they might have to deviate from their um, normal maintenance path of uh, um, you know dropping slash. They're getting better where they're chipping it. Um, rather than dropping it, but there's some pretty inaccessible areas in there and they they don't, uh, they can't A, if they allow it to grow, the beavers will use it to dam and if they, if they, if they chop it and leave it, it's gonna get, as the creek meanders back and forth through there, it will, 
it has the potential of creating natural dams and, re and reversing the flow. Thanks, Paul. I think we have a few people who are still uh, waiting to ask questions, and I believe the chat has been enabled as well. So if people um, can enter their questions in the chat, we will get to those as well. So, Paul, can you see who's next on the um, with yeah. their mic enabled? Patricia, can I just uh, just quickly oh, say sorry. response? Uh, yeah, thank you for your, your questions, comments. Uh, definitely helpful. The situational awareness and the history is very helpful for us, so we will take that back. And I'm sure Graham and uh, Graham are uh, yeah taking note of that as well. Uh, we have been working with BC Hydro on this, and we have made them aware of it. And I know Graham and Graham are connecting uh, with their geotech uh, group as well. Uh, but we will definitely share this. So thank you. Thanks, Mark. Rick is next. Go ahead, Rick. OK, can you hear us now? Yay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, first off, um, we would like to know uh, what considerations have been taken for assessing the damage um, on the Pool Creek riverbanks and uh, if there is any um, allowance for for restructuring that, i.e. Uh, rip wrapping, we've had significant erosion at the back of our property. And with the creek very low right now, it's not an issue. But as soon as that creek comes up again, every rainfall or severe melt, we're going to have further erosion. And that's going to cause the creek to deviate from its natural uh, creek bed. So uh, is there any allowance for um, some sort of diking procedure, um, rip wrapping riverbanks, anything like that? Rick, maybe I'll take a stab at that. Um, I'll say from a local government and a provincial perspective, uh, we're really focused on the public safety piece um, in terms of keeping uh, the river from uh, you know, changing its natural course. Uh, I think that would have to be, Jay McEwen, are you here? Uh, would you be able to address that? Hi, Rick. Uh, Hi. Regarding any uh, works in and about um, Pool Creek and uh, trying to armor the banks or anything like that, you'd need to speak with uh, the Ministry of Environment. And what they do is uh, go through a process called working in and about a stream. Um, if you wanted to do this on in an, on your own property and your own uh, shores uh, in relation to Pool Creek, um, as far as assistance uh, right now, I don't believe that there uh, there is any uh, funding or anything available for property owners who have their shorelines changed from a natural event such as this. Um, it's something that we can go back and look into, but. Um, I don't think that there's uh, anything, any streams available right now. But if there was work that you wanted to undertake on your own, um, it would have to be through the Ministry of Environment and uh, potentially through uh, the Ministry of Water, Land and Resort Stewardship as well. Okay, thanks. Paul, are we able to move to the next question? Eggy is next. Yep. Maggie, um, go ahead, enable your mic. Oh, we still can't hear you. Okay, we're going to go on to the next person. Sorry. Can I just interject? Um, Maggie Fredette wrote a, a comment in the chat. Oh, okay. Because she can't, her mic isn't working. Michelle or Paul, can you read the question, please? I, I can uh, do it for you. That's easier. Thanks. Uh, so, uh, question is, uh, my name is Charles from 9040 Pemberton Portage Road, and my concern is our water table is getting lower and a lot of the use of the water for our water use. Should we be concerned? Um, 
Maybe, or Charles, this is something that we have been discussing, and we've, I know Christian has also been helping uh, keeping us informed of uh, that concern. I think uh, if there are concerns about the getting too low, we would definitely like to hear. Um, but I think as we work through uh, the the overarching issue about uh, the channel and the flow, uh, that uh, hopefully will uh, alleviate uh, that concern and risk. And I'd welcome others to chime in if you have something to add. Yeah, I think just again from the geomorphology standpoint on this too, uh, I'm not sure how how exactly your well is being recharged right now, but if it's shallow aquifer or something like that too, obviously the, the loss of surface waters to that could affect your well recharge in those areas uh, for sure. Uh, it would have a lagged response, so I would anticipate. So seeing seeing the river come back, I imagine in those surface waters come back through could could potentially support shallow aquifer wells. Yeah, Maggie can I came add, back. Sorry, can I add one more thing here, guys? Charles, uh, it's Jay McEwen. We know each other fairly well. Uh, if you want to reach out to me offline, I can help you uh, with some well information on your property as well. We can uh, look up that together. So just follow up with me and send me an email and I can help you out. Thanks, Jay. I think Susie has been waiting for a bit. Are we ready for the next question? Yes, Susie, go ahead. Thank you. I just uh, wanted to know if the uh, hazard assessment and the reports that Stantec are putting together will be publicly available. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Who's oh, in you, Arnick? Sorry, go. Sorry, one, one other thing I, I, I should have mentioned, one of the interesting things of having an extra three feet in our field is the ospreys are busy fishing out of it. That's it for me, thanks. Then you are next. And maybe when Susan uh, and I'm going to get into it, uh, there's another qu uh, question in the chat, which I can maybe read out loud from Mike Roger. Uh, so it's high. We have a low lying seasonal pond, uh, bracket swamp, on the Pool Creek side. The water rose quickly and filled it to overflow. This was due to the culvert on Pool Creek Road that couldn't handle the volume. Is there a plan to enlarge the culvert or put in a proper bridge? Uh, Graham, maybe I can ask you to start on. Uh, if you've yeah. been aware of that. For sure, yeah. So generally the Ministry of Transportation Infrastructure handles um, these sort of items to do with uh, culverts and bridge crossings. They have a general design protocol that's followed for those sort of um, procedures. It would be good to either reach out to a ministry representative directly or potentially go through the SLRED to support you getting in contact with them to identify this concern to them. Um, because if there's a risk to road infrastructure, generally they'll come and do an assessment and that assessment could lead to further um, mitigative works. Thanks. Are there any other questions in the chat or are we good to move to the next? Um, I think we can try Susan and Ahmed again, if you're able to unmute. And you're more than welcome to uh, put a question into the chat as well, and we can address it there. I see uh, Mitch Giffen, you have your hand up. Uh, yes, um, Hamid and Susan texted me with their questions. Uh, so if you don't mind, I'll pass those along. I think you mentioned the environmental assessment is ongoing, but just I, they're wondering if there's a timeline uh, for that. With respect I to salmon? Sorry, Mark. I suspect it, it. They'd be curious about the salmon situation, but I think, um, as you know, uh, Hamid and Susan and Jens and Taryn and his family have been significant. The waterfront is significantly affected as well. There's a lot of erosion and um, damage to infrastructure. So I think uh, they would be curious as well about that part of the environmental assessment. And is there a timeline for that? I think you mentioned that 
the fisheries issue is an ongoing thing that you had a meeting today even uh, it was discussed um, but uh, I think they're wondering about more information on that and a couple of other questions after you've answered that one I can start maybe so on the public safety side which uh, we are, and that's the qualitative uh, assessment. Uh, Stantec, I know, is prioritizing that work, and uh, we are hoping, as Mike said, that it's we're hoping uh, weeks uh, is the time frame to start that work, or even shorter. Um, so as soon as we uh, get an understanding of the recommendations of the issues, the recommendations, we uh, and the kind of the the way forwards. Uh, our process is that we go to uh, the province and put in a request for funding support to do this. Uh, and as soon as we get uh, that uh, support uh, and path forwards, and I know that our partners are also standing by to support us in uh, addressing the mitigation work. So from DMO, DFO and Walrus in terms of permitting, uh, we'll move forward. So we are expediting this. There's a, there are a number of variables, but we are trying to do this as soon as possible. Okay, th thank you for that. And I, I think you at least partly answered their next question, uh, which was uh, who actually will manage the project if, it, if the decision is made to re-divert the Place Creek flow to Pool Creek? And also where do the funds come from? It sounds like the funds come from um, a request to the province. Uh, but, and it sounds like it's your team and your uh engineering colleagues i suppose uh, but any more information on that would be appreciated yeah certainly i think it's it's a uh it's complex jurisdictional piece uh the slrd does have a uh, responsibility and mandate related to public safety um and we are uh authorized uh through uh yeah through legislation to take action to ensure public safety when we look at uh, salmon bearing and fish bearing streams, uh, there are uh, DFO and other provincial agencies who have uh, kind of a mandate to uh, oversee that work. Um, but this is an interesting uh, bringing together of multiple kind of uh, overlapping areas of interest. Uh, so it depends on uh, the recommendations that are found in that uh, report we are getting from Stantec about what the next steps are. Uh, and uh, as mentioned, if the SLRD uh, receives uh, information that suggests that that is the way that we need to proceed, uh, we will uh, will move forwards with our uh, ability and that will support DFO and Walrus in achieving also their pieces as well. But it is, it will be a joint effort uh, all the way through. So, and Graham, please feel free to add. Yeah, for sure. Um, just to, to preface as well, I, I know living with Flood risk is not pleasant to do at all, so that's not lost on me. And our team is is trying our absolute hardest to get this put together as quickly as possible to facilitate the next steps as quickly as possible. Um, oh, there's my son. Um, yeah, so to, for the actual works itself, then what would happen is we'd be retained by whomever is the uh, the authority that's pushing this along. To provide the design uh, once the design is put together we would be on site along with an environmental monitor to collaboratively construct uh whatever the works would be to re-establish the creek uh, yeah so maybe maybe i'll just add so the slrd has all the power for um alleviating public safety risks but we have very little power when it comes to dealing with environmental concerns in this particular case alleviating the public safety work, there's potential that this is going to be really great for the environment and salmon habitat as well. But for those other pieces, we need to make sure that the uh, federal and provincial ministerial leads are in charge of those of those other pieces that we can't handle within that public safety scope. Thanks, Mike. I think we have Mitch again with a question. Sure, I have a this is a a bit of a bizarre question, maybe, but is there anybody who would say that this is due to this event? I understand that uh, global out or um, glacial outbursts are they happen and they, they uh, I think there's an Icelandic word for it, Jokulap. Um, but I'm just wondering if this is due to climate breakdown. I know that they occur naturally, but is this a a result of the increased temperatures we're seeing over the last 12 months worldwide, 
and just uh, the climate catastrophe that certainly BC seems to be have endured since the heat dome in 2021. Yeah, I think so. Oh, go ahead, Mike, please. I was going to say, so my understanding of climate change is that you measure it kind of on a statistical level and uh, and it and it tells you about patterns. Um, aside from that, the system is so complex that it's very, very difficult to tie individual events um, to uh, uh, to climate change. So, you know, we've always had forest fires. We've always had landslides. We've always had glacial outbursts. Um, the fact that they're occurring more often now is statistically attributed uh, to climate change. I think a lot of scientists would say that, but we cannot say that this specific event would not have happened were it not for climate change. Graham? Yeah, well, but like, I think uh, I think you hit the nail on the head there. So, and, and kudos Mitch for getting the terms right. Good job. <laughs> Thanks. Um, Susan, are you able to enable your mic yet? Or maybe enter, oh, I think we have you. Did you have a question? No, oh, I think we're still not hearing you. Mic is enabled, but doesn't look like it's working at her end. Are you able to enter your question in the chat, perhaps? And then maybe while we're waiting, we could go to Ian. Yes, hello, thank you. Um, there seems to be a, a fairly strong consensus amongst the um, persons affected on both sides of the yeah, watershed that they'd like to see um, pool or place creek redirected back into the pool creek watershed um, and it sounds like from the regional districts uh, point of view that they have limited tools to make that happen um, you know unless um, um, you know, the people start drowning in Susie's field. Um, is there any um, avenue for um, uh, us to uh, have our our uh, wishes uh, um, registered um, amongst the uh, decision makers? You know, I think, oh, and I think and is there a, is there a, or and or is there a, a role for community involvement to uh, sounds like it even if uh, it was considered desirable to relocate it the funds might not be available is that something that uh, community groups can take on you know we we have to follow the hazard assessment where it goes but uh, I would say that there there is significant uh, potential that uh, that the public safety hazard assessment is going to say that directing the flow back into Pool Creek is is the best thing to do from a public safety perspective. I mean that that option is out there. Um, I don't want to say whether it's the most likely option or least likely option, but if that is, if 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 all stakeholder like if all stakeholders from a public safety perspective agree that that is what it takes to keep people um, yeah safe from hazards, especially in fall atmospheric river season, then uh, uh, if if that's where the science takes us, then that's that's where we will go, and uh, it will be a, a government-funded project. Insofar as public safety is is fixed with it. Um, Susan, are you able to use your mic? Yeah, she actually posted a question in the chat. Oh, in the chat. Yeah. Um, could you read that question, Paul? I can hear. I can I can read it out. So Susan has said I wanted to ask about the environmental impact on the lake itself. Are there assessments planned for the fish and duck impacts on the lake? I could say I can. that. Sorry, Mark. No, you go ahead, Mike. All good. Uh, Department of, Department of Fisheries and Oceans and uh, the Ola Nation Fisheries Techs uh, were out there last week. I don't know how far up they went or if they went into the lake. 
But um, as it stands right now, there's the leads on uh, these environmental issues. Um, our focus has been really on public safety because that's that's where we can can put money. That's uh, I just the the way the law is written. Um, I, we local government can't put emergency funds uh, towards uh, assessing uh, environmental impacts like that. But uh, I am aware of other other agencies and, and First Nations um, looking into at least some of that. But I don't have a, a fulsome update beyond that. So it sounds like Thanks. a question that we can take away. Yeah, uh, and Susan and also Ian as well. I think uh, I think this we will be taking these questions and uh, what we hear today back to our partners in DFO and Walrus and express uh, these concerns as well. Uh, Paul, is there anyone else with their hand raised? I'm not seeing anyone, but I just want to make uh, sure. No, there are no more hand raised hands. Um, did anyone else have any other questions at this time? Just want to reiterate what Heather and, and Mark mentioned there, that we are compiling all of this information that we're gathering tonight and uh, putting that together and um, just we're coming up on six o'clock, but we do still have a few minutes left. Oh, oh. Um, and um, just wanted to say that um, if you do have questions that come up after this, feel free to reach out to us anytime by email. Our email address is there for the communications department, and then we can disperse those um, inquiries as they come, on, come in and get those answered for you. Um, we're also all um, easily accessible through the staff directory on the SLRD website, so you can reach any of us through that. Um, and if you want to reach out to that communications email address, we could also start a distribution list specifically for this group if you want to receive updates by email. Um, and I wanted to apologize for our technological challenges. Um, really appreciate your patience. Technology is fantastic until it's not. Um, and we're, we're learning as we go with these events. Um, and then I think if, um, yeah, if nobody has any more questions, we'll move it over to Heather for some closing remarks. Unmute. Um, I think we have one last question that came up and it would see when will when will there be a next update? Uh, I think I could probably say that our plan is to continuously update the community and one of the first places that that happens is um, through our communication channels, through newsletters and social media, but also with this group. I know that Mark and Mike have been in communication, and we've really um, appreciated the support of Christian for that communication. Mark and Mike, can you give us a kind of estimated timeline of follow-ups for this questions, these questions? Maybe Patricia could uh, support that one. When do you think we'll have another update? I know that we have some reports from the engineering, engineering from Graham and Graham, coming in the next few days, when do you think the public will be advised of the next steps? Yeah, uh, thank you, Heather. I would say, I mean, as soon as we get any changes happen, we've been trying to uh, share them through the community update that we put on uh, our website and on social media. Uh, I would hope uh, early next week that we would have uh, our next update and uh, we're still not sure what that information will be yet, but our hope is early next week we'll have a community update. And I think this forum is uh, when there are substantial changes, uh, I think, uh, and we'd love your feedback if this is a, a good forum to engage uh, with you on, uh, but uh, we would definitely be open to holding another uh, kind of town hall on this event if that is uh, appreciated. Thanks, Mark. And thanks, Patricia and Michelle and Paul for being the technical advisors today and really appreciate all of your help too. I know that just being on the other end of a computer, there's a lot of different steps to log in and be heard and thank you for enabling to the chat so we can be more inclusive to everyone uh, we'll we'll try to iron out some of our hiccups here tonight and make sure that uh, we continue to improve and that's 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 how fail fast and learn from your mistakes and move forward and that's what we're going to try to do i want to thank Susie for mentioning the ospreys because uh, it is a story that we're hearing that the, there's a lot of good fishing for the birds happening right now and as much as that's a, a, a great story to tell, we do want to make sure that everyone's back to safety and back to their properties being safe and themselves being safe. Uh, the SLRD is hearing a lot about the redirect and bringing it back to Pool Creek. And we have heard that loud and clear. We're hearing that from many different levels. 
And uh, I think that we hope there'll be a positive outcome for everyone here. Um, it sounds like if we're looking at safety, it's one of the strong voices in the room. So thank you for that. We do so that we have the tools and the tools are the reports from the engineers, the public safety, and then funded through the province. I must say being part of EOC uh, for a few EOCs since I started in January, once the public safety risk is no noted, EMCR is fast in responding and supporting steps that need to be taken to ensure public safety. So I don't have any hesitation for that. And I think that once once it's noted in the reports there, we'll get swift, swift answers from EMCR, Department of Fisheries and Oceans and Walrus. We are working alongside them, really pressuring them to take a lead and be part of this to ensure that the environmental impacts are also considered and prioritized. So I want to thank everyone for being here today. I know that being in, in an active EOC is is stressful and it's it really affects your community and it affects your day-to-day -day life. And it you wake up in the morning with questions and you wonder if they'll be answered by the time you put your head to bed and sometimes they're not. So I want to thank everyone for being understanding, everyone for um, we we do not make it an easy decision to put an evacuation alert or order in. We don't take it lightly. We take this this state of local emergency. There was a lot of discussion around that, and it was to immediately react and fix some problems as best that we can. I want to thank Santec for being there and readily available to make that happen. Uh, it's our hope that we're going to be able to answer the, all your questions tonight. I hope we did answer a lot of your questions, and any ones that we weren't able to answer, please contact us. This isn't just a one hour, you got our time and then we're done. We are here to answer all questions that come up. Um, some you might think of later or some that you weren't able to answer now. And we'll pro try to provide you with clarity and next steps. And so like as Patricia said, do not hesitate to reach out to any one of us. And we are on the contact list. My email is hpaul at slrd.bc.ca. And I want to thank everyone. I want to thank the staff for being here today and tonight for participating in this. The, the town halls are a way to engage with the community and be inclusive so that anyone from anywhere can, can take part. And we know sometimes being in person is always preferred. And I want to thank you for doing this online inclusive meeting so we can get all the experts in the room being able to share their knowledge. There's no more questions. I'm going to pass it on to Patricia to wrap it up and say it's nice seeing all your faces and he hearing most of your voices. And I can't wait to look forward to hearing the rest of you at another time. Thank you very much. Thanks, Heather. Um, I just wanted to flag that I think Susie Gibbs had another question, but we saw it in the chat. So she's asking us to just share those updates and we'll make sure that we get those out to the community. Um, so I think that's it. There's no more questions. Thanks everyone for